I lay on the floor and we turned off the lights and I went into a real ultra meditative state. I was com completely relaxed and even halfway through it I thought this is this is really really good for me. I'm feeling great. I'm feeling a lot calmer, a lot more relaxed and at ease with everything. The, the piece contains this uh, pedal note throughout the 136.1 cycles, which is a very low frequency. And that frequency is an integral part of this piece of essence. As the other sounds came and went, there was always this pedal note of calming reassurance because as the, the pedal note was getting quieter, I felt an emotional loss and like, please don't take my pedal note away, I need it. And I was getting dependent on the comfort of this low tone, I found that something that was kind of unique to this piece of music that I hadn't come across in any other pop music or classical music or film score. This feeling of, I want it to come back. I think that the, the, the big difference between records that hit that spot and don't hit that spot is still a mystery to all but very few people. My experience with Essence is it does very strongly hit all the right spots, emotionally and physically and mentally. Music has its way of healing because that's what most of us, nearly 99% of us engage as a method to calm ourselves down because music is connected with emotion and emotion regulation. So in that sense, music can, whether you study it scientifically or not, humans engage in music. It's, it's the scientist's interest to study this human behavior, which is already there. So people are using music it's just that why should this help? How should this help is the question. We're having conversations with Dr. Shantala Hegde of the Music Cognition Lab to really study the potential of using the ASC method within a scientific evidence-based setting to learn and understand how the process of music making from an ASC method perspective could help people's brain-body health connection. And it, this is really, really in resonance with our intention of Alchemic Sonic Environment's mission and vision. And we're super excited to be embarking on this collaboration together. So you're going to be scientists, you're going to do these anonymous tests. I'm going to ask you um, a few questions. I think if we can actually prove categorically that, that for a child listening to, to music in school um, in a particular way, um, getting them sensitive to sound improves their educational attainment and therefore their possible path in life, then we've got something really powerful if we can actually prove that. Close your eyes and relax for the next four minutes. So we played 136.10, the composition um, also called Essence, that is basically designed to get people in touch with their environment because it's based on the rotation, the revolution of the um, Earth around the Sun. And the feeling is that this mathematical connection enables people to feel a physical connection with their environment. So we were experimenting to see whether listening to this, to this music would affect their performance in a mathematical test.
with the Beatles sessions, they wrote their own rule book. One of the things that, that stuck with me from very strongly from that time is that the Beatles were always moving forward. At no point on Abbey Road did any of them ever say, do you think we could go back and recreate the guitar sound that we got on Revolver or Rubber Soul? They never referred backwards. And not only is the technology moving forward, but, you know, the, the creators, the musicians are moving forward and everyone's looking to do something that no one else has, has done before. With essence, why use a conventional setup when you can do something completely innovative? And then, how to convince everybody <laughs> to do it. Um, because this was probably the one case, because it was so completely different, I couldn't really do the insurance policy of a conventional setup. I just had to say, I think the chances are good enough that this will work very well. You know, you had some concerns about how will the musicians react to this and the singers as well, the choir. And I thought this music is so different and so original and so innovative that they're already out of their comfort zone. How much more out of their comfort zone could they possibly be? And um, it worked. It worked great. We immediately posted a couple of pictures on social media of the setup at Abbey Road with partially dimmed lights to make it look less like a Abbey Road recording session. And immediately I got a whole load of other artists and composers and engineers writing in saying, wow, I've got to try this. Or somebody else said, oh, yeah, I thought of that. No, you didn't. <laughs> but uh, it created a lot of industry interest in how, how would this work and is this a, a reasonable invention for recording in surround atmos uh, every dimension because it, it, we're not just talking about stereo and surround we're talking about height and width and everything it's it's all it's all new my feeling about immersive audio and uh dolby atmos that kind of thing uh was actually to take a, a very organic approach to it you know and we we invented a few things that again like from my days of um of the beatles where we would invent stuff we invented new techniques that as far as i was concerned had never been done before mark had sent me a photograph of the whole of the royal philharmonic sitting in a large circle with this uh lecturer standing in the middle and i looked at this and i said that's the way we ought to record this. They've got to all be in this circle, all facing the middle, rather than any kind of conventional orchestra. As a clinical neuropsychologist, uh, my day in and day out, my work is to look at patients who have neurological, neurosurgical or neuropsychiatric condition, studying their neurocognitive profile, helping them with neuropsychological rehabilitation, helping them gain back the cognitive functions or the functioning aspect that they've lost due to the illness or injury, and help them go back to near normal functioning at least. And my area of research focus, research interest is neuromusicology, or music and cognition, being a student of music. So recently got the appointment as a visiting associate professor and visiting scientist at the Beth Israel Deconis Medical Center, BIDMC at Harvard Medical School. So these two passion that comes together. So my aim is to study music as a universal behavior. There are different schools of music therapy. Like I follow neurologic music therapy, being a neuroscientist and look at that evidence. But prior to that, prior to getting all these neuroscientific evidence of music, you know, listening and 
how the brain processes, people tried to explain it through different schools of thought, including psychodynamic school or humanistic school approach and all. What they felt was, even today, music listening can have an impact on how you guided imagery. You can help the person have a visual imagery in a particular way or helping patients, for example, bring, bring out their autobiographical memory, which would be so hard otherwise, to, in, especially in degenerative conditions. The skill of deep listening can be used to promote learning, awareness, um, perhaps even improve mental health, certainly feelings of peace and tranquility. I did feel a difference because the first time I did the test, I was more rushed, but after hearing the music, I felt calmer. After the music, it was actually quite nice and I felt like not too rushed. When we listened to the piece of music, I felt more calm or relaxed. I hope a study like this will send a really powerful message to, to institutions around the UK. And the preliminary mathematics is good, so let's see where it goes. If We need to do it probably many hundreds of times before we can actually say we have conclusive proof, but it, at the moment it feels really good.